This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. This week, we are talking about Murray Rothbard, the economist, as opposed to Murray Rothbard, the sociologist or libertarian theorist. And our show features a talk by Dr. Joe Salerno delivered just this past weekend at our 35th anniversary event in New York City, where Joe makes the case that Murray really is the rightful heir not only to the Austrian tradition, but to the Misesian tradition within that school. Uh, Joe makes the case that man, economy, and state is one of the four major treatises in Austrian economics. And also, you're going to be fascinated uh, by his account of Friedrich Hayek's view of Murray's place uh, within Austrian economics. So if you like Murray, stay tuned for a fantastic speech by our own Dr. Joe Salerno. I'm thrilled and I'm honored to be here to honor the uh, institute that uh, really molded my thought and gave me an outlet for uh, my academic work. Uh, without the Mises Institute, I, I certainly wouldn't be the same um, scholar that, that I am today, such, such as I am, um, which is, is, pales in comparison to the person that I'm going to speak about now, Murray Rothbard. So my topic uh, that I chose to address you on was Murray Rothbard, Mises' true heir. I chose this topic because in the, in the past 10 years or so, there's been a concerted effort in some quarters of the Austrian movement to deny Rothbard his just due as Mises' closest disciple and as the initiator of the revival of Austrian economics. The story, according to the Rothbard deniers, I like that, goes as follows. Yes, yes, they say. Rothbard wrote some foundational works in the 1960s, Man, Economy, and State, America's Great Depression, The Panic of 1819, and Power and Market. But then in the 1970s, he became disengaged from economics and from the economics profession. Now, what that means, they, they love that word, disengaged. That, that is, he was not engaging in a conversation, conver they like conversation too, in a conversation with mathematical and positivist economists. In other words, he thought it was crap, and he was pushing forward economics in the correct direction. Uh, but um, by the 1980s, uh, the, the fable grows. Uh, by the 1980s, uh, Rothbard abandoned academic pursuits altogether and became a political activist and propagandist for libertarian ideas. This is what they tell us. Well, let's put this tall tale to rest by listing Murray's publications since 1980. Um, he, he wrote a number of foundational articles and, 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 and a number of books. So let me just list a few of them. Uh, the Myth of Neutral Taxation, 1981. Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution, 1982. The Federal Reserve as Cardinalization Device, 1984. The Case for a Genuine Gold Standard, 1985. The End of Socialism and the Calculation Debate Revisited, great article, 1991. His books included The Ethics of Liberty, 1982. Now, this is all while he was only really a, a political activist, and, you know, who, who was playing politics in the Libertarian Party. Uh, the Mystery of Banking, 1983. Ludwig von Mises, Scholar, Creator, Hero, 1988. And finally, his great classic, um, which rivals anything that, that has been written in, in, in the history of economic thought, the Austrian Perspective on the History of Economic Thought, which unfortunately came out posthumously. Um, and uh, during this time, he had the time to found the first Austrian economics journal in North America, the, the Review of Austrian Economics in 1987. And of course, Rothbard's scholarly works have continued to pour forth 22 years after his untimely death culminating in this grand, maybe it's not the culmination, but culminating for now in this great work that Patrick Newman has edited, um, The Progressive Era. That in itself is something that his critics could only dream of, of, of putting on their resume as a sole work. And when we think of Rothbard's works, I mean, it's just, um, they pale in com comparison. So contrary to the Rothbard deniers, Murray Rothbard was a creative genius and the greatest economist of the past 50 years. He was also Mises' true heir, as both Mises himself and Friedrich Hayek, who was a, a great uh, historian of thought when it came to Austrian economics, both attest. Let me just read uh, 
a, a few things by both Mises and Hayek and what they said about Rothbard. When Rothbard published Man, Economy, and State, Mises reviewed it and th enthusiastically re endorsed it. Uh, now, by the way, so the Rothbard deniers claim that, that Austrian economics sort of culminated in Mises and then went to Hayek and then other people picked up the Hayekian thread, uh, uh, Hayek built on Mises, supposedly, and then uh, Rothbard sort of shunted the train onto the wrong track, that is, on the track down to Auburn, Alabama. Uh, and this was only libertarian activism. So this is what Mises says. He, he called Rothbard's work an apocal contribution to the general science of human action, unquote. He w then went on to declare, quote, henceforth all essential studies in the bra these branches of knowledge will have to take full account of the theories and criticisms expounded by Dr. Rothbard, unquote. It doesn't sound like he thinks that Rothbard wasn't one of his closest followers, now does it? Mises gave high praise to Rothbard's treatise despite the fact that parts of the book were intended to correct, improve upon, and fill in gaps in the system of economics that Mises himself had created. In fact, in one particular case, uh, Rothbard explicitly disagreed with Mises, and that was the theory of monopoly. Mises had conceded that the formation of a monopoly price above the competitive price was theoretically conceivable in an unhampered market, though very unlikely to occur in practice. He generally uh, attributed the source of, of a monopoly to government. Rothbard argued to the contrary that the distinction between monopoly and, and a competitive price was conceptually meaningless in a market economy. Now, Mises was once asked his opinion of Rothbard's disagreement with his theory of monopoly price by uh, Joaquin Reg, uh, the Spanish translator of human action. This occurred at the Mont Pelerin Society in 1965, and we have two accounts of it. Mrs. Von Mises said that her husband had replied, quote, whatever Rothbard has written in his work is of the greatest importance, unquote. However, the Spanish economist, Jesus Huerta de Soto, has reported that when Reg himself used to recount the incident, he would quote Mises' response as, I agree with every word Professor Rothbard has written on the subject. And let me just say a few words about about Hayek and, and how he viewed Rothbard. Um, he wrote, although I owe, this is Hayek writing, although I owe, I do owe Mises a decisive stimulus at a crucial point of my intellectual development and continuous inspiration through a decade, I perhaps most profited from his teaching because I was not initially his student at, at the university. I was not an innocent young man who took his word for gospel, but I already came to him as a trained economist, trained in a parallel branch of Austrian economics. So he was not trained in the same branch as Mises, which um, uh, Bon Bavark, the great Austrian economist Bon, bon Bavark, had started. Uh, continuing, um, Hayek uh, wrote on Rothbard 1977, or, or wrote on, on Mises' followers. He said, in today's world, Mises and his students are regarded as the representatives of, of the Austrian school, and justifiably so. Although he represents only one of the branches into which Menger's theories had been divided by his students, the close personal friends, Bon Bavirk and, and Wieser. I only admit this with some hesitation because I had, had expected much of the Wieser tradition, uh, and he was in the Wieser tradition. And he says these expectations were not fulfilled. But he goes on and says, today's active Austrian school almost exclusively in the United States, and that's Murray Rothbard, and this is 1977, is really the followers of Mises, based on the tradition of Bombavark, Mises' teacher, while the man in whom Wieser had such great hope um, never fulfilled his promise. So it was Mies Mises and Rothbard, Mises' branch as, as, as carried on by Rothbard, uh, that was the, uh, the, the uh, living and thriving branch of Austrian economics. Finally, uh, Hayek, we recently found that Hayek wrote uh, an introduction to a, a work by Rothbard, a short work, two essays on methodology. And he wrote, among the thinkers who have made outstanding contributions to the peculiar problems raised by the science of human action, Ludwig von Mises has probably been the most acute and most original thinker of modern times. Professor Murray and Rothbard has been profoundly influenced by his work in this field. Both of us, meaning Rothbard and Hayek himself, has been trying to develop it further. And if this has sometimes led us to modify Mises' conclusions,
perhaps even in different directions. I am sure this is what Mises would have expected and even desired. He then goes on to say that the present state of this tradition established by the large treatises written by Mises um, should be, um, be made possible, accessible to readers of the ninth, of the ninth decade, uh, he's writing in the 1980s, in a condensed form by one of his best authorized disciples uh, is certainly to be much welcomed. His best authorized disciple being Murray and Rothbard. Okay, so now we've got that out of the way. Um, Rothbard, for all his scientific brilliance and genius and, and scholarly achievements, was also my friend and, and, and a real person, as he used to like to use the term, real person, had a real job, um, who was, uh, had, was rooted in, in his or her community, um, who loved American culture or the culture that they were born into. So permit me to recount some anecdotes which reveal his great personal charm and genuine humility. And I can go on for quite a while because Guido has gracefully ceded me his 20 minutes. No, no. <laughs> Let me first say a few words about my own conversion to Austrian economics. I was, I was converted in my junior year of, of, of college. I, I was already a libertarian to some extent, but I'd never heard of, of, of Austrian economics, um, despite the fact that I had already taken two macroeconomics courses uh, and I was well into my junior year. Uh, and then a student who was a conservative um, said, uh, I was talking to him about free market economics, and he says, well, you know, it sounds to me uh, like you need uh, to um, read a, a little booklet. And he handed me this booklet. It's 30 pages long. It's called a mini book. This is the original one. There used to be a series of these. And it was straightforwardly called Economic Depressions, Cause and Cure. It was written by Murray Rothbard. Uh, really the first time I heard the name, actually the second, I heard it in a magazine article, or I read it in a magazine article. And I learned more in 45 minutes reading that pamphlet than from listening to lectures in, in my macroeconomics courses and from reading very ponderous and boring textbooks. One of the textbooks I was assigned, and I have a prop here, I see Guido, you can match this, was Paul Samuelson's seventh edition Okay. This is 821 pages long and weighs five pounds. I weighed it before I came here. Okay. And it, it, it's as dumb as it is dense. So, so I, uh, I, I certainly owe to Murray Rothbard my conversion to, to Austrian economics. I mean, that's really cool. I, mean, I just sat there and I read it in my car before I went to my macro course for, for 45 minutes and I said, I didn't go to the course. I didn't go that, to that particular class. Let me uh, tell you about my meeting with Murray Rothbard, my first meeting. Um, I met him while I was attending graduate school the following year, well, actually two years later. Um, in, uh, he, there was a, 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 a libertarian conference in New York City whose featured speakers included Rothbard, Robert Lefebvre, Carl Hess, um, it was the first time I had met any of these giants of, of the early libertarian movement in person, and I was especially excited at the prospect of hearing Rothbard speak. Uh, Rothbard followed Lefebvre on the program, and if you know anything about uh, Robert Lefebvre, um, his, he was an anarchist, but he called his philosophy autarkism, um, which meant self-government, and uh, he was an extreme pacifist. He didn't believe that you could use um, violence even in self-defense. Uh, so, um, when Murray spoke, uh, I was really impressed with his joyfulness, affability, and, and sense of humor. But his wit and his humor were especially on display in the question and answer period. When someone asked him his view of the extreme pacifism of the fave, um, which prohibited any form of violence, as I said, Ro Rothbard replied, well, if someone was threatening me with an ax and I had a gun, I'd plug him. Uh, I subsequently invited Rothbard to give the, the keynote address at the New Jersey Libertarian Convention. Uh, I, I was one of the founding uh, members of, of, of the Libertarian Party, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> prior to my talk, I introduced myself to him. We, we made some small talk, and then I told him that I was a graduate student in economics and that um, uh, I was currently following up some of the citations in his work, Man, Economy, and State. Uh, I was reading articles by Frank Fetter and these, these others he had mentioned. His eyes immediately lit up, 
and he seemed like he could barely contain himself. He just kept looking for a pen and, and, and a pad that I handed him. He took down my phone number and, and my, um, my address, and he said, that there, well, there are people in New Jersey, that, uh, professors and students who are currently have a read, an Austrian reading group. I'll give, you, I'll give them your information. The following month, I, I didn't think he would remember, but the following Monday, someone showed up at my door and didn't even call, showed up at my door and said, Murray said that you, know, you would like to join the reading group. So you know, I, I, I did do that. Um, and, and the reading group was, was run by one of my other libertarian heroes, Walter Block. Uh, so I was soon invited to the inner sanctum of Murray's apartment in Manhattan, and if you saw the apartment building if you were on the tour yesterday. Um, on the way over, I was extremely nervous. I, 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 I thought that he would uh, grill me and, and, and expose my staggering I ignorance of, of libertarianism, uh, libertarianism and Austrian economics. But my apprehension instantly dissipated when Murray excitedly greeted me at the door and said, Joe, my boy, it's great to see you again. So that's the only second time I met him. He made me feel like I was one of the few people in the world that you know, was, was his friend. It was a memorable evening. My fellow student and I, the guy who drove me over, we sat on the living room rug while, while Murray regaled us from his couch with jokes, anecdotes, opinions on, on, on uh, very politically incorrect opinions on current affairs. Um, but his lighter conversation was interspersed by questions to me um, on economic and political matters. At one point, the question of what methods were justified in recovering one's property from looters came up. Um, this was right shortly after the, the riots that we had in our, in our, in our cities. Um, Murray was of the opinion that a store owner was justified in using defensive violence, including deadly force if absolutely necessary, in defending his property from looters. But he believed that if the looter had already seized the property and was running away, the, own, the owner could not plug him. Um, he could not employ the deadly force to retrieve his property. So I, I timidly suggested that the store owner would be justified in using deadly force, um, if necessary, to recover as well as, as, as to defend his property. I didn't see the, the difference. So Murray thought for a minute, and he says, ah, now that's a conversation I, I'm willing to have. Um, and also d during that evening, um, another topic came up about how we would return uh, government property, state property, back to the private sector after the libertarian revolution. Murray was always very, very forward-looking. Um, so uh, he, he was very lukewarm on my suggestion that it should be auctioned off and the proceeds divided up among taxpayers. He was also not keen on giving ownership of the property to the employers, public schools to the teachers, um, railroad to the engineers and conductors, I mean, really. Um, these options were too time consuming, would require a, a state to sort of carry it out, continuing the state to, 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 to you know, return the tax money, uh, and or would give the, the, the property to the wrong people. Uh, so the overall writing goal was to return the state property to productive use in the private sector as soon as possible. So he said the best solution and he said this with a twinkle in his eye, is to give ownership of these assets to the heroes of the libertarian revolution. <laughs> uh, so in the years that followed, I, enjoy, I might have time for one more anecdote. Uh, in, in the years that followed, I enjoyed increasing personal contact with Murray. I saw him many times at conferences and seminars, and we meg regularly met for lunch at Wolf's Deli uh, in, in Manhattan. Uh, what struck me most about him was not just his creative genius as an economist, social theorist, political philosopher, but the fact that he himself called himself a real, uh, that he himself was a real person. Now, he used that term endearingly of other, other libertarians that he liked, that he thought were grounded, real people, uh, who really loved not just liberty as sort of an arid, empty construct, but the real system of, of political and economic liberty. Um, that gives rise to the institutions and the culture that allow human beings to thrive and to live. And this explains why Murray cherished and celebrated American culture and society and was proud to call it his own. Um, he was very much a cultural American, a cultural New Yorker. Uh, Murray was an unapologetic admirer of American culture because he viewed it as a, the specific historical product of the relatively libertarian and individualist pre-New Deal American society. Thus, he loved Godfather movies, not the third one, he hated the third one, um, as, as we all should, and, and, and James Bond movies. He loved visiting visits to, late night visits to Denny's restaurants when he was out of, out of New York, 
And um, he loved drinking martinis with his friends at the Algonquin Club. One last very quick um, anecdote. Uh, I once was at a conference with Murray, um, and it was u- the usual long conversation until t- um, well into the early hours of the morning. He was hungry, and so were the graduate students. We were all graduate students. So we piled into my car, and uh, we drove around uh, looking for some place to eat. Of course, all, you know, every place was, was, was closed. Um, and, and, and Murray was getting more and more agitated. And he said, what's wrong with these people? Don't they understand that the Industrial Revolution took place 200 years ago? We have electric light. He says, why aren't they serving their, their hungry customers? So just as we were turning around, I spied a, a, a pizza place. And, um, and so we, we pulled in, and, and, and Murray, Murray said, heroic. You're, you're a hero of the, of the of revolution, because I found an open place to eat. Okay. There are many other things about Murray. I loved Murray. Lou Rockwell, who unfortunately cannot be here, loved Murray. Uh, just last week, we were speaking about something, and we both, almost at the same time, said, I wonder what Murray would think about that. Thank you. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.